We have all been there. You fall in love with a brilliant, whimsical, moving TV series that you know is flying under the radar or struggling in the ratings, and then out of nowhere, boom, canceled. A series with terrific promise cut short in its prime. Devil! Dozens of amazing TV shows have fallen into that trap over the years, and now the great pop culture debate wants to determine, what is the best TV series canceled too soon? I turned my Sensei cluster into a real clusterfuck. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. <laughs> Please help me welcome my panel. <laughs> Please help me welcome my panel now that they've stopped cackling. <laughs> no matter what happens, she knows she can walk away from this episode tall. She'll walk away tall. It's Ama Marfo. I'm excited to yell about TV, so deal with it. Deal with it. Here with like some really, really deep thoughts. Hey, I know that girl. It's Joelle Bodecker. Eric, you're so beautiful. It hurts to look at you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and her bark is worse than my bite. Welcome back, GPCD's log lady, Kate Reculia. My log has something to say. <laughs> That's iconic. Take a drink. <laughs> So before we get to the debate, how does this work? We made a poll of 100 or so of the most notable TV series to be canceled early in their runs. We stuck only to shows that had two seasons or less. If they came back much later or had a standalone wrap-up movie, they were still up for contention. But if there was a third season, didn't make the cut. Sorry, Happy Endings fans. More than 120 people took the poll, we tallied their votes, ranked the picks by popularity, and added them to a bracket. Now we argue about it and insult each other, all for your amusement. Want to play along at home? You can. Head to greatpopculturedebate.com and go to polls and brackets. There you'll find the downloadable listener brackets for this and every episode of our little show. Do your matches pick up with ours? Do you think the network needs to look at our ratings? Let us know by dropping a comment on this episode at our website or by yelling us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, if you're curious about how we went from the top 32 down to the sweet 16, become a Patreon supporter of our podcast. Our Patreons at the $5 level or higher get ex exclusive access to the warm-ups slash part one for each episode in which we work our way through all of the round one matchups. It's like a whole bonus episode for each topic and includes arguments you will not hear anywhere else. And it's only one of the great Patreon perks, so please consider supporting us on Patreon today. And with that out of the way, let's skip the pilot and go straight to series. Let's begin the debates. First up, it's the high school outcasts of freaks and geeks, a one seed, up against small town quirks and ritualistic murder in Twin Peaks, a five seed. <laughs> Kate will talk about freaks and geeks and I will take on Twin Peaks. Geeks. A lot of rhyming. Kate, why don't you go first? So Freaks and Geeks is, when I say seminal, early dawn of golden age of television series, I mean shows like Freaks and Geeks. Very ahead of its time in terms of the ways that it combines comedy with drama, uh, narrative throughout a season with uh, with um, discrete episodes. It introduced the world to Linda Cardellini, John Francis Daly, Seth Rogen, Martin Starr, Jason Siegel, Busy Phillips, James Franco, your mileage may vary, um, <laughs> Paul Feig, and it's really the first uh, Judd Apatow produced TV show. Contributions from Mike White. Mike White's sleeping mm. on the couch. I think he's Busy Phillips, uh, Kim, oh, Kim, what's her name? Kim, uh! <laughs> I forget her character's name. Kim, I think that Kim so Kelly. Kim, Kim Kelly. Kim yes. Kelly. Yeah, I believe he's Kim Kelly's brother, who's just like sleeping on the couch what? in that episode, which which was not shown on TV because it's such a it's such a upsetting episode when you see what Kim Kelly's home life is yeah. like. See, I'm talking about them like they're real people that I went to high school with. <laughs> um, it's an enormously sincere, funny, thoughtful, deeply influential show about being a teenager in the 1980s. It feels nonetheless, I was not a teenager in the 1980s. I was a teenager in the 90s. And yet the emotional beats of this show are so fantastic. It's a really exceptional in and of itself. It's complete. It could have gone. It could have gone. Like, it ends on a cliffhanger. We don't know what happens to Lindsay and Kim when they go off to, to the Grateful Dead concert instead of, like, her math camp. <laughs> like, I will never forget the feeling of, like, I was her mother. I was Mary Jo. Oh, gosh, what's her name? I'm so terrible with names tonight. <laughs> like, uh, her parents, the heartbreak her parents are going to feel when they realize that Lindsay has gone off and done this thing. But also, you go, girl. You live your life, freaks and geeks. <laughs> Keep on trucking, Lindsay. Um, yep. 
I know I'm not going to win this argument, and I'm completely fine with that. I will admit that I actually missed Freaks and Geeks because I think it was airing when I was in college and working like three jobs. So I was both the freak and the geek, um, although not in that particular way. But Twin Peaks, I also didn't watch when it was originally airing. I went back and watched it. And I mean, you want to talk about some absolute banana pants. The fact that this was even made is incredible. Um, David Lynch is a definitely a polarizing figure let's say that and i am not going to sit here ladies and gentlemen and tell you that every episode of twin peaks is good it's not there's a (laughs) lot of bad stuff i'm not even going to talk about season two but i will say that there are moments of season one in particular of twin peaks the pilot's amazing and there are parts of that first season that are gripping um there's also some really incredible teen performances in there too um why am i forgetting the actresses they've gone on to do um some fairly uh Lara Flynn sing- Boyle. thank you Lara flim yep. boyle uh the one that plays um audrey, audrey. Uh, yep Sherilyn uh, Finn. Why am I you. the one? All, Jesus, guys. They all had three <laughs> names, right? I did just watch it most recently. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. But they were all really good. Kyle McLaughlin is excellent in his role. Um, the cast is incredible, actually. Oh, Madchen. Madchen Amick. Oh, yep. Madchen Amick. Yeah, she's amazing in a really kind of small role um but she's still working she's still doing great stuff it is a very strange show there was nothing like that on tv at the time and it inspired so many other shows i think what's working against twin peaks is that um whereas other shows you're like what could have been we saw what was with twin peaks and what was with twin peaks was the it was a huge success the network got involved in ways it was not expecting to and they ruined that show they completely destroyed it in season two it did get the follow-up movie and it did come back for us a, a kind of retread like 20 something years later something like that um but it it went down it went down in flames hence fire walk with me but um i do think <laughs> that if you're looking at just what it did to tv because i think it w- ha- had profound impacts that are still being felt would we have the x-files without uh twin peaks i don't think we would um but i i also agree with this with the sentiment that like it it ruined itself or people ruined it and freaks and geeks remains pure um so with that i'm gonna put it to a vote ama where are you on this one i'm gonna stay with freaks and geeks okay that's fair and Joelle, if you listen to the part one, absolutely hated Twin Peaks. And so <laughs> I'm going to assume that I have not swayed you. Um, no, you haven't. But I, 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 can, I can I throw in a fun little tidbit? Yeah. Um, because having just watched the whole series, from episodes one and two and the horrible movie, and the first three episodes of The Return, and that's when I finally gave up. Um, it's amazing I lasted that long. It was painful. My husband kept asking me why I was watching it because I was mad all the time. <laughs> But what I what I did appreciate was that at the very end of the series finale on season two, uh, she, uh, Laura whatever said, "I'll Palmer. talk to you in Palmer." Yeah, that's her name. I I was thinking of Laura Flynn Boyle, and my brain just combusted. But yes, Laura Palmer. Yes, everyone knows her name. I knew her name before I even watched the show. <laughs> She, uh, uh, she says i'll see you in 19 years and literally the show came back so i thought that was yeah. pretty freaking impressive um yeah no yeah go ahead kate i am i am definitely a team uh freaks and geeks for that reason that like twin peaks ended kind of when it needed to um it's impossible to overstate the influence this tv show has. It's, this tv looks the way it does now because of twin peaks um, because of its, uh, you know, mix of genres, mystery, drama, horror, surreal, melodrama, yeah. but also like very like frightening. Oh my God. Um, the Bob stuff. Like if you, and if you uh, figure out how uh, like Bob came to be and like read the story of how like Bob became a character, it is mm-hmm. fucked up. Do you guys know that yeah, story? Really, yeah. So it's wild. It's wild. it's wild. So literally they're filming the scenes where the mother is screaming in the house. It's like the first or second episode of the series. And um, in the mirror is a reflection of Bob. But Bob was actually a member of the crew who was oh. there shooting. And like yeah. by mistake, he got caught in the reflection of the mirror. And David Lynch is like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we actually made you this like menacing spiritual thing that's wow. actually behind all of this going on? And that's how Bob starts. But like, what a crazy story. And also yeah. Bob is fucking terrifying. Like, yeah, yeah. That, no, that also it, tells me they went in without a plan. <laughs> well, yeah, no, they definitely did. Well, David Lynch's plan was like, if he had had his way, we would never know who yeah. killed her. Right. Right. Exactly. The network and, demanded something. Yeah. Yes. And the closest thing, like Lodge 49, which I just talked very briefly about in the warm up episode, has kind of 
like has its cake and eats it too it sort of tells you some things like the emotions of the characters have resolution but it does lean into that like we're never going to really tell you yeah um if you're if you're jonesing for that kind of thing but anyway freaks and geeks, freaks and geeks. Same. so yep. freaks and geeks moves on i'm sorry to the twin peaks fans out there there are many of you um but here we are next up it's the surreal high high school antics of clone high a six seed versus the satirical office world politics of better off ted a two seed joelle graduate clone high to the next round while ama will explain why we are in fact better off ted go ahead ama you first so in the warm-up, I talked a lot about Clone High as being this very weird, very special thing that we got for a very short time on television. And Better Off Ted in a lot of ways is that, but in a live action capacity, which sounds wild, but it really is like a near cartoonish level of satire of um, office politics and the way that large bureaucracies and multinational corporations work. Um, there are a lot of arguments that I think I could make in favor of it, but one that I want to make sure gets put out there, because I don't know how this vote is going to go. Um, <laughs> their fourth episode about racial sensitivity starts with um, the water fountains at the company, which as part of like a saving money mechanism, they decide to automate. And what they realize fairly quickly is that the water fountains, the elevators, anything that requires like sensing a person, it can't see black people. So they end up having this scheme where they have to hire white people to walk in front of the black people to be able to use anything in the company. <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous, but like the way that they go about the argument and the way that companies are thinking about it, like this show has been gone for at least 10 years at this point, and we're still having the same conversations and just how resonant it is in a wild way, but it still makes exactly the point that it needs to make. Like, I wish there were more shows that were able to do that in such a silly way as to be able to be like, do you see how ridiculous this is? Like, we're among the most ridiculous TV shows on television, and we can figure out how to talk about this. Why can't you? And they do that with a lot of things like scientific ethics, relationships in the workplace. And it just was something, again, so weird, but so, so, so special at what it was doing. And I wish we got more. Joelle, what about Clone High? Um, well, first off, I have to agree all of that. This, these two shows, by the way, Clone High and Better Off Ted are beloved shows in my home. So <laughs> choosing between your favorite children is what's happening right now. Um, yeah. So what I will say, Clone High, um, it came out so many years ago. I was, in, I was in college. I remember literally I was like going home for college. And every time I went home, I would like binge like five or six episodes because I didn't have cable in college. What's that all about? <laughs> so I watched that's how I, MTV wasn't on like streaming yet, right? You had to just wait till you were in front of a cable box. Mm -hmm. um but i loved it i it's a show I, we should i should preface all this by saying i don't watch cartoons it's like not a genre i get into or whatever not not a genre is it like a, a vessel uh it's, it's not, a, it's not a, t a type of show i really get into often and clone high just pulled me in i think it was the just profound appreciation and understanding of history that actually at its mm -hmm. core is what sold me um and i actually i couldn't say it better myself but i found this fantastic review of it that i just would like to read if that's okay um each character has learned of their historical counterpart and acts in ways to live up to them. Abe is afraid to stand up for anything and is timid. This is because he knows that he, that he as president Lincoln died. Uh, Joan is angsty and gothy because she never actually got God's message like the original. And so she doesn't believe JFK only really heard about the original's affairs and good looks. So he's running with that. And, uh, and Gandhi just can't live up to his father. So he parties to forget his failure. And it's and like just these four characters and knowing that deep, like miss, like just mysterious history that they have to like live up to and then can't, it's more profound than a cartoon deserves to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just some of the lines is absolutely, are absolutely ridiculous. The show literally opens up with the phrase, I'd invade her pay. Oh my God, I'm going to ruin it. Pay I'd invade her pay of pay <laughs> if you get my meaning. And I just, I couldn't believe that a show could start that way. And I was, I was in tears. So I rewatched it again and I, I, I forgot how much I loved it. So it's, it's so good and somehow just keeps getting better. Yeah. It's put some A's and A's on there. <laughs> oh Ira would like a party <laughs> platter. <laughs> uh, Kate, where are you on this? Oh God, this is so hard. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, Clone High is—I've seen episodes of Better F Ted. It's extraordinary. 
Clone High is like etched into my soul. So I, I almost like whatever decision I make is going to be deeply personal. <laughs> I think I have to give it to Clone High. But if Better Off Ted goes forward, then like it, I feel it's, very happy. It's not a loss. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, there there is no loss in this matchup. Yeah. There, um, but there is. Um, but I'm just kidding. Mm. Um, no, this is a really good, uh, a really good matchup. And um, I have seen episodes of both shows, but I was not as uh, um deeply in- ingrained in them as some of you are. But I think based on the arguments, I'm giving it to Better Off Ted because I think it has more relevance. The fact that it's been gone for a decade and we are still dealing with this stuff, and I think it's also got a wider, um audience like scope, a wider like, scope yeah. i think it's yeah. something that more people can pick up that is not to say that a niche program is not good you'll be seeing later when i'm arguing for a medieval musical but um i i think based on arguments and, and mind you both of them are very good i'm going to give it to better off ted which since it's a tie better off ted is a two seed mm-hmm. and it will inc- uh, uh advance so i'm can sorry I, can i bring in an additional point by way of consolation yes <laughs> So when it got difficult, and this was the most difficult matchup on my bracket, yeah. the reason that I managed to move Better Off Ted forward, ultimately for me, it was about, are there opportunities to revisit this at some point? And some of these shows that have been canceled have since had a revisitation. Clone High is being revived by MTV, and we're getting more next year, I want to say. So for me, like the prospect of getting additional canceled too soon, but then revived allowed me to put it to bed with a little bit more peace of mind than if that weren't the case i i am comforted by that it is yeah i'll also add that there was a whole gandhi scandal and they're actually gonna probably fix that for the new season so another reason better off ted didn't uh didn't have that problem against it exactly (laughs) uh next up we have joss whedon's space opera firefly a one seed versus aaron sorkin's literal inside baseball with sports night a four seed kate put on your brown coat for firefly while joelle will try to score for sports night and i'll have kate go first so, uh, as we discussed in the in the first uh, warm up to this, Joss Whedon, real complicated, problematic showrunner, creator, etc. In the way where you're like, when you know allegations or stories of his like really shitty treatment, specifically of women, but of lots of different people mm-hmm. that work with him, come out. You go back and you watch the shows, and you're kind of like, mm, yeah, that tracks. Mm. <laughs> like, I, I see it. It's there. It's in the text. Firefly is not a perfect show. Firefly, do I think, is in some ways the most perfect example of all the good stuff about Joss Whedon working and kind of like just getting to the edge of what it could do in terms of scope and scale and not getting a chance to do that in the film television or in the television um, like version of it. Right. And then we have Serenity, the movie, which does wrap it up nicely. Um, it, it's incredible cast of characters in this incredibly ambitious space Western, which at the time people <laughs> looked at him and were like, but what? <laughs> and you're like, but actually that kind of works, kind of works. I mean, maybe some of the scenes where you're like getting the cattle off of the ship looks a little silly, but like, I'll give it to you. Uh, Nathan Fillion, leading role. This is the show that introduced me to Gina Torres, Mm. queen icon forever. Alan Tudyk, Marina Baccarin, uh, Jewel State. We discussed the the, the, uh, Tasty Sean Mahar Mahar, and discovered what he's doing now. Check out that first episode, Patreon listeners. Um, Ron Glass, like it's just Adam Baldwin, complicated. Mm. (laughs) I thought we weren't even going to mention it. him. Yeah, I know. I guess I, I had to. I, I I had to to be complete. I guess, but it's a really um, a really compelling new way to kind of look not update, but look at the the model that a Star Trek right and and how can we how can we do something with it that's an interesting genre spin and like people just really love this show I watched it on DVD really got into it I I feel like my ardor for it has waned in 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 in, in the sort of like preceding years but it's still a really classic when you think of like cancel too soon Firefly comes up pretty high Joel sports night Sports night. Well, first, I just want to say in my notes for Firefly, I wrote Firefly. Oh, my God, today. Firefly <laughs> flew so the Mandalorian could soar. That's what I wrote. I was <laughs> literally thinking I was that. just going to say that. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. If you because, enjoy the Mandalorian, yeah. you will enjoy Firefly. Yep. Yeah. There's there's the, 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 the space Western is not something anyone would have given anything to. You're absolutely right. And then Firefly yeah. happened. And now Mandalorian is like nailing it. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, but for sports night, um, I will go back and say 
the reason the show caught my attention, because it should hopefully go without saying based on all the shows I've been on so far, uh, that I don't do sports. I don't care about sports unless it's the Olympics. Uh, so sports night is not really something that should have caught my attention. But if it wasn't for Josh Charles, I never would have signed up for that. Uh, show. He got me too. Josh, he got me yeah. too. Josh yeah. Charles and Don't Tell Mom the Babysitters Club. Yes. Oh my yes. God. Don't, don't Tell Mom the Babysitters dead. My mouth no. is not no. functioning today. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitters dead. Uh, he was probably one of my earliest and first and most long lasting crushes. Absolutely. Uh, forever and ever and ever. Absolutely. And so it's a good one. Like, He's on it's TV. A great one. Very I can good watch one. him. Peter Krause is no, no one to, you know, sneeze at. Uh, we have. Um, Felicity oh, well, Huffman. Felicity Huffman's in it. Josh Molina, who like, I mean, he's had quite the career after that with all of his uh, Sorkin connections. We, this show had Robert Guillaume, which like yeah. it did. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it, it had a fantastic cast for this this little thirty minute sitcom about making sports shows. And again, it's a very specific thing for I guess lots of people like sports, but for me, it feels very specific. Um, but yeah, the show is the show is brilliantly written. Um, it, it pulled me in because I, I I love the speed of it. So this is like I'm watching this show before I ever watch Gilmore Girls, and the, and the, the walk and talks and the speed of the dialogue, the snappiness. This, these were like things I didn't know I wanted until I saw it for the first time, and these were all things that are now considered tropes of Aaron Sorkin, but he did it here first, so you can't really blame it for being tropey when it was the OG trope for him. Sure. Um, I think you'll see these parallels from sports night when you go into all those other shows and go, Oh wow. He really does that a lot. Like those, 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 <laughs> those like the head of the newsroom soliloquies and all that stuff that you then yep. see and everything after that from like the social network. It's just, it's all Aaron Sorkin, but people, people dug it and they gave him a bunch of seasons of the West wing because of it. Um, it's unfortunate that the show didn't um, keep going, but I, th I think what happened was, he got into the West Wing and then he wasn't about to write two shows since he wrote everything on the West Wing and that nearly killed him. So No, they um, it was he it was not pulling in viewers. It was that simple okay. at the time. It was not a, a rating success. They tried so hard to push it and people just were not biting. Yeah. Which um, and it's unfortunate because I think a show like this now, uh, you know, workplace comedy drama, like people love yeah. that sort of stuff, yep. right? Like it was yeah, I was gonna say that now. is it was a dramedy at a point where we didn't know what to do with that. Yep. And I think yes. now yes. in this, where mm -hmm. dramedy is so common that like, even now is like, I look at like pitch competitions for places like HBO and ABC and stuff. They're like, stop pitching us those. We have too many. And this was the only one. <laughs> yeah. So like mm -hmm. people did not know what to do with it. They're like, we don't know how we're supposed to respond to it. And it, if you had it now, I think it would have been received very, very differently. And it was so okay. misunderstood. Yeah, it's, it's like uh mythic quest. Yeah. Like mythic quest yes. Did, right? Yes. Yes. Did. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I was going to say, yeah, and was, on top of that, it was so misunderstood because they like the, the network wanted to put laugh track on it. And Sorka was like, this show does not need a laugh track. And they were like, nope, got to put a laugh track. And they were wrong. And they slowly faded it out across the first season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the second season, it was completely gone. And that was when America finally understood what a sitcom without a laugh track was like. And it was okay. And it was safe. And this, this show crawled <laughs> so that the office could, could run. Right. Like th th it's, yeah. yeah, that's it's fair. The, it's, it's the prequel in a way. <laughs> that is fair. Amma, where are you on this one? I'm giving it to sports night. I'm giving it to Firefly. I'm sorry. Oh, don't hate me. Oh, wow. oh. Well, I I know I stumped for Firefly, <laughs> but I, I've de I've decided to give it. To Ooh, uh oh, <laughs> uh oh. Okay, I will make a last ditch effort in an attempt to try to save Firefly because I think there are a lot of people listening to this right now who are picking the brown up the brown kids have been doing this for years, Eric. Yeah, they have <laughs> the pitchforks and, and torches. But here's one thing I will say: number one, um, when you look at the actual list of TV shows canceled too soon, Firefly is often mm -hmm. at the very top of it in fact i believe yeah. hulu in 2009 did its first like tv shows we'd bring back uh poll whatever and firefly easily won that um in terms of which one of these two shows had a fan base that still to this day continues to stump hardcore for this property like it's still being published in comics it's had the yep. follow-up movie it's got mm -hmm. board games it, it has an entire culture around a what 13 episodes is that what it was 14 ish yeah. something like 14 that. i don't even think all of them aired did they um yeah they, they aired 13 <laughs> out and out of order no less yes of course <laughs> So the um, fact that they yeah. bollocksed it that bad and it still continues to have the level of devotion that it has among its fan base. I've, I've been to various cons where they have like 
um, sing-alongs for Firefly. Like mm-hmm. it is an honest <laughs> to God Jane song, right? It's a big one. <laughs> but like I've seen them do entire like amateur productions, and I mean real amateur. <laughs> but um, bottom line is, it to me is a um, it's its own cultural icon moment. Whereas Sports Knife is a seed for what comes with Sorkin, but I think he has uh, stronger shows on here. I'm not sure that Whedon does. I think that um, mm. Kate nailed it when yeah. she said this is kind of Whedon at his best. And I would agree with that, um, partially because it was short-lived, so he didn't have opportunity to to gum it up. Um, mm. But I, 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 I think it feels wrong to me for it to lose to Sports Night. But I will defer to the panel. Is, is everybody still going with Sports Night here? Ama? I am, yes. Joelle? Yep. Kate? I am. And so I, I hear your argument and it is a good argument, mm-hmm. but in it also sort of like, I don't need any more Firefly. Yeah. There's tons of Firefly. There's tons of it. The, the you know, comics it are, do can- a great job, right? You don't need to. Yeah, it, it was money. canceled too soon. And then that like started an entire industry, right? Like sports night could have kept going from where it was and it didn't. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, after the break from this, from round three to round four, all of my panelists will give their socials, so you can feel free to yell at them no, please don't, instead please of don't. me because I did what I could. <laughs> Ryan, if you're listening. Way to stick the internet on women, Eric. My God. God. How Joss Whedon of me. Um, Ryan, if you're listening to this, I really did try. I really did. Um, Next, it's the musical slackers of Flight of the Concords, a three seed, versus the struggling cater waiters of Party Down, a two seed. Um, Ama, bring the Concords into harmony while Kate serves it up for Party Down. And I'll have Ama go first. This was one of the other really difficult matches for me because they're both such good shows and they both... I believe topped out at two seasons. Yep. Um, I think in terms of being able to advance one over the other, I know that there are periodically conversations about bringing party down back. Whereas flight of the Concords, they were definitively done in the sense that they don't want to do it anymore. Yep. Um, so the mechanism by which we would get more is less clear with flight of the Concords, but it is, it's just a silly show of like, aimless guys going through New York and they want to be really good at music and they're just okay at it, but it's actually made by musicians that are very good at what they do and have found ways to incorporate songs that they had already written years ago into storylines. So it's like a fun way to bring music into a show in a way that's different from like your typical musical. And yeah, I think it's just, it's so much fun. It's so smart and so silly. And then I think it kind of gave us the opportunity for shows like broad city or like detroiters where it's just like a pair of people taking on a world that they don't really understand and just being so so silly about it so i love that form and yeah i think we're definitely at a point where we're not going to get more and that was that slightly outweighed my choice between the two of these that's a good point uh all right so uh party down kate take it so Party Down is an ensemble half-hour dramedy in the lineage of Sports Night um, <laughs> about cater waiters in Los Angeles. It's written by, among others, Rob Thomas and Paul Rudd. I didn't know he was one of the writers. Mm-hmm. Um, with a ton of Freaks and Geeks and Veronica Mars alums. Martin Starr, Lizzie Kaplan, Kristen Bell, Adam Scott, Ken Marino, Ryan Hansen, Jane Lynch, Megan Mullally. They kind of like, because of the, the structure of the show, every episode is a different party that they're catering. Mm-hmm. So every episode has a chance chance for new cameos and like um uh Enrico Colantoni is there (laughs) JK Simmons shows up like it's this incredible mix of workplace comedy uh satire of Hollywood but it's also and it's deeply funny and deeply silly but it's also really humane and like like sort of um deep about the difficulty and precarity of pursuing a creative life (laughs) like it's really because they're all of the people who are cater waiters they're actors they're writers they're entrepreneurs they're dreamers who are cater waiters and they can't quite seem to get out of it or if they get a break they're almost afraid to take it or they had a break like adam scott's character who was in a commercial and i forget what the tagline is it's something like are we having are we having fun yet fun yet there it is he's not we having fun yet guy like it's just a really it's a really (laughs) thoughtful funny show that where there's a lot more going on under the surface um i love party down joelle where are you on this that's also by the way the perfect catch line catchphrase to have for a show like party down so that at every party he's at someone will say that um i (laughs) 
uh, yeah, I loved both of these shows. I think yeah, it's a hard one. I think my love for Veronica Mars and Rob Thomas verse has me leaning towards Party Down. Um, so I think that's where I am at this exact moment in time in history. <laughs> I said in the preview, and I'm sorry, Ama, I, I just don't get Flight of the Concords. It does nothing for me. It's one of those weird little niches of pop culture that I just cannot seem to resonate with. So for me, and I, I actually do very much enjoy Party Down, so I'm throwing my vote to Party Down. Um, and it is actually the higher seed, which surprises me because I feel like Flight of the Concords had more cultural cachet. Um, do I sometimes sing business socks to my cats? <laughs> Yes. Do I sometimes hum Fuda Fafa? <laughs> because why not? Why not indeed? <laughs> With that being said, Party Down advances, Flight of the Concords is out. I'm so sorry. Um, it I, don't, is the- I don't think there's a loss in this matchup. Okay, good. So, good. so I'm totally fine with it. Everybody's feeling good. Everybody's feeling wonderful. Excellent. Are we having fun? <laughs> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Next, it's a Brian Fuller smackdown. As one of his most beloved early cancellations, Pushing Daisies, a one seed, is up against one of his very first shows, Dead Like Me, a four seed. We were unanimous in our decision to push forward Pushing Daisies, but Joelle did want to say something briefly on Dead Like Me. Go ahead, Joelle. Uh, Dead Like Me was a heartbreaking show. I think it had way more potential than it ever met. Uh, Brian Filler left the show early on, which I think is why the show was sort of a bummer in season that two. That happens a lot with Brian Fuller, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I understand he's a bit of, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the story, but he, yeah, there's some complications with him and producers. They never agree. Um, I think that show ended with just so many open questions that I can see why there's a forever interest in getting more dead like me. There's just, there's so much no one knows about how this, you know, post death world works. It's like gravelings. What are, what are they even like? No one ever knows. So there's that. And I also know that there's lots of mysteries left with Pushing Daisy. So both shows, mysteries still to come. <laughs> yeah. And I will say um, justice for Jasmine Guy, who was so good oh, and I'd like Seriously. Me. I Ugh. adored what a, what an her on that show. unexpected. She was fantastic. So good. So good. And Battleship Patinkin was also good, but um, <laughs> I, I'm always going to go for for uh, Miss Jasmine Guy. Oh, and Next, Nigo Montoya. <laughs> <laughs> Next, it's a battle of two shows about getting up in everyone else's business in very different ways. <laughs> Sensate, a three seed, versus Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23, a two seed. Ama, talk about Apartment 23, and I will mind meld with Sensate. Ama, you go first. Uh, this was just such a fun show that like even as I was watching it it was one of those things like there are shows on here that when they ended I was surprised that they were leaving I think Don't Trust to Be was one of those ones where you watch it and you're like this is too good to last and that (laughs) felt really really sad I mean thinking about kind of the nature of Kristen Ritter's character and just being that ridiculous person that's always going to get somebody a little bit naive into trouble um James Vanderbeek playing himself and just being very on board with it. Um, his assistant, Luther, who I maintain, if they somehow manage the mythology of a Luther, Luther crossover where he ends up being an entertainment-based rival to Titus, Titus Andromeda, I would watch that show <laughs> oh all day God. long. Yes. Um, yes. And even like Eric Andre, like the most grounded we've ever seen Eric Andre, yes. there were just so many unlikely parts that came together where it was like, this was canceled too soon, but like, could it have lasted? I don't know. Just it's it was a bright spot that burned far less long than it should have, and I miss it all the time. And that's thank you for making such an amazing argument for me for Sense Eight because um, I agree with you. <laughs> don't trust the beat gave you exactly what you wanted, and it went out at the right time because if it had not, Kristen Ritter would not have been able to go on to be Jessica Jones, and we all mm-hmm. would have been the poorer for that. And the beak has gone on into other projects as well. None of them come immediately to mind, but <laughs> Jador, James Vanderbeek, always have, always will. Um, so Sense Eight. Um, since it narrowly advanced into round two, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this and while your head is exploding <laughs> from that, um, I'm just going to lay down some science for you. So the reason Sensei only lasted for two seasons on Netflix plus the wrap up movie is because it cost nine million dollars per episode. <laughs> that is oh that is legit true. Oh, man. How do you spend nine million dollars an episode? Let me tell you. Number one, you have the Wachowskis who are the creative minds behind it. Yes, we all go to the Matrix personally i like to go for speed racer but um also they did the cloud atlas movie and this is a very similar type of thing about the interconnectedness of all of us and it's a very beautiful um spiritual 
but also um uplifting story even though it is terrifying in parts um like the the actual uh people that are chasing them and by the way the, the mega plot is eight people who have seemingly nothing to do with one another all wake up one morning and suddenly they are all able to like hear each other's thoughts across the world by the way like across the world and like communicate with one another and see one another um it's totally weird but it makes complete and total sense by the time you're in like episode six and you get incredible incredible story arcs you've got um sun who is the uh south korean she's the um businesswoman who's trying to take over her father's empire she also happens to be an amateur champion kickboxer which comes into uh play very easily wolfgang who's an art thief in germany you have um who am i forgetting riley who's the icelandic dj who's heavily involved in drugs because she's trying to escape traumatic past you have the um trans character nomi from san francisco who's a hacktivist um there are so many amazing i didn't even talk about um oh the the indian one whose name i can't who it was like the heart of that show and i adored her. uh kala kala and then you have mm-hmm. um the the mexican actor who's uh Lido, Lido. <laughs> whose career is going to be destroyed because the paps find out that he's actually gay and in, a, a, in love with a man it is got action it has incredible drama it has incredible story arcs um it is one of the sexiest things i've ever seen like there's at least two full-on orgies in that show and they're amazing did you even get to those kate no i haven't oh girl (laughs) get yourself a bottle of wine and a thing of chocolate whatever else you need it's a good time um but it is so ambitious and it is so well executed is it the fact that they were able to accomplish what they were able to accomplish is amazing to me even with nine million dollars and every penny of that is up on that screen um then that's the reason it got canceled it was so expensive and so ambitious netflix is like yeah this is great and people do really like it but we can make like five shows for this one and we don't think we're ever going to be able to grow this to be like a orange is the new black level rating mm-hmm. struggle or not mm-hmm. so i think as much as i love the don't trust the be in apartment 23 and i do genuinely especially Kristen ritter and vanderbeek um the sheer ambition and balls of sense8 to me makes me believe that it needs to advance to next round i'm aware you on this i stand by don't trust to be that's fair i've made my impassioned argument it's all i can do <laughs> joelle i i felt it i really did i sensed it but it's still don't trust to be for me as well <laughs> all right and kate I am gonna give this to Sensei. Uh, you didn't mention the Freema Eggman. Yes. Oh, I love from Doctor Who. Yeah, and Naveen Andrews and Daryl Hannah. Daryl Hannah, <laughs> exactly. Um, California Martin M- Mountain Snake. What were you saying, Kate? <laughs> I I am gonna give it to Sensei because of the sheer ambition of it. Um, and and yeah, I don't know. I don't trust the bee is such a incredible cocktail of weird working perfectly kind of right from the jump almost. I don't know how much longer it could have or would have gone, even though to be fair, I, I, I binged uh, don't trust the bee and I'm still making my way slowly through sense eight. It is not bingeable. It's, it's not, not poppable. That's true. It's very like sit down and watch an episode and like take, take a moment. <laughs> yeah. I actually think it would have worked better on a network than it would, than it yes. did on Netflix. To yeah. be honest with you. If yes. it was an HBO show, I bet you it would still be on the air. It would have gotten yeah, at least six that's, seasons. That's honestly probably true because I think the nature of how it sounds like you need to watch it versus the nature of how Netflix is accustomed yeah. to designing content. Yeah. That's a fundamental mismatch on a network stand point so i think it would have been really difficult to keep it going there but maybe somebody else could have done something different with it yeah absolutely yeah. Yep. so with that being said if it's tight and right now don't trust the b is a two seed sense eight is a three seed so don't trust the b advances again i say to you i did my best um please do not harass my panelists they are wonderful people and they're very smart and you should listen to their opinions but if you disagree with us Go on to our website, greatpopculturedebate.com, and tell me all about it. Next up, it's Teen Angst. You love it. I love it. And the fine chemical mm. manufacturers at Noxema love to advertise during it. <laughs> so it is My So-Called Life, a one seed, versus Bunheads, a four seed. We were unanimous in our favor of My So-Called Life, the 90s, I'm not going to call it the original teen drama, but it kind of was. Can anyone think of an 80, a, a teen drama that predates it? Uh, now Twino predates it, but 
not in the not in the way that they talked about teenhood sure. it yeah. was yeah. landmark for what it was doing yes yeah. yeah and we will be talking about it more in round three because it is advancing over bunheads and then finally in round two high concepts galore it's a medieval musical gallivant a six seed versus the drama based on a comedy show studio 60 on the sunset strip a seven seed so i'm gonna let ama talk about studio 60 and then i will come in for the chorus and support gallivant go ahead ama so again, too, it's one of those things where I thought a little bit about the strength of the premise and the capacity for it to go long term. And I think that if you're looking at what you could mine realistically for a longer period, it feels to me like Studio 60 has a lot to be able to mine for future seasons. So thinking about the nature of late night comedy as a whole and how long it's existed, you could go... How long was the West Wing? Eight years? You could go eight years and probably not duplicate things. And I think a lot about Gallivant and musical TV in general, where there is kind of a shelf life to it, both between the capacity of the songwriters to do good things with stories and also not to make this too personal to any individual creator, but Dan Fogelman over time, um, he's not quite to the degree of like Orion Murphy or Brian Fuller, but like that work over time does tend to diminish a little bit. So I do kind of wonder how long that concept could have persisted. Um, So I think by virtue of cancel too soon, meaning there were a lot more stories to tell for me by length, studio 60 does that in a way that Gallivant doesn't. And again, I say that as somebody that loves musicals, but how long could it have gone? I wonder. It's a damn good argument, Ama. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you. And also, as you were saying that, it occurred to me, Smash is not on this list, and that is very surprising Uh, to me. Good Lord, how did that happen? How did that happen? That one was fun to watch, but... A mess. (laughs) Um, So here's my argument for Gallivant, which, just so everybody knows, both of these narrowly advanced in round one, up against the ones they were. If you want to listen, become a Patreon subscriber. Shameless plug. Um, But Gallivant would appreciate that, and Gallivant would write a shameless plug into its music, because that's the type of show it is. It is (laughs) goofy. It is irreverent. um, It is... Uh, very ambitious there's two or three original songs by alan menken every episode it's a medieval musical there's nothing else like it on tv now or or ever before i think if you like uh robin hood men in tights if you like the princess bride if you like um monty python and the holy graham uh, graham the holy grail (laughs) slash spam a lot i like Um, these uh these hybrid shows we're coming up with right now (laughs) someone should green light these and let them go for more than two seasons yes i was be like we're gonna call our network malaprop yes <laughs> i'm into it um and malapropisms is, is, is will be on firefly there you go it all works so um i uh, it's a fun little ditty and i'm glad it got two seasons because the first season is not great and in, in fact multiple cast members on this panel have said yeah i tried it and i didn't really love it i'm right with you when i first watched the first couple episodes of gail i was like this is not great but by the time you get to season two it's wonderful um but i hear ama's argument as to how much longer could that realistically have been sustained The one thing I will say about Studio 60, which 100% did have more potential, was I think there were very serious problems with the casting of Studio 60 that I think ultimately hurt it. Um, I think Sarah Paulson is an amazing actress. I stan her. She was completely miscast as the Mm -hmm. romantic lead on that show. And I, if I had to put one thing as the reason it didn't work, it was that. And also, I actually don't think that people like Bradley, what's his name? Whitford. Whitford. Whitford, Whitford, yeah. Yeah. I don't think that people actually like Bradley Whitford. I think they like the character of Josh on the West Wing. Mm -hmm. I don't think Bradley Whitford himself is likable. Period. That's very interesting. Like I don't actually know if I agree or disagree, but that's an interesting uh premise. I've never heard that said, but I I'm going on with it. Like Matthew Perry, (laughs) everyone loves Matthew Perry, but like if you have that (laughs) that trio as your core cast members, and two out of three, I think, are unlikable slash miscast what are you gonna do and then of course the sketches aren't funny and that really is what tanks the show but i i hear ama's argument that there's a lot more juice to squeeze out of that lemon and i'm i'm not arguing that at all kate where are you i'm i'm that's a, a great argument and i am i'm with Ama on this one i think there was it was canceled too soon it didn't get a chance to fix its clear problems right yeah. it just didn't yeah yeah and joelle uh, because I don't particularly want more of either show, I think well, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go with a show that I would love to see rebooted better, and that's 
Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Okay, so that means that Studio 60, which is a seven seed, by the way, advances to round three. <laughs> Sometimes we get a Cinderella story. I don't know, man. Uh, this is one Sorkin, jacked up really. Cinderella. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that is it for the end of round two. We're going to leave you with a cliffhanger to ensure we get renewed for one more season, and we will be right back. Hey there, listener. Hope you're enjoying the great pop culture debate. If you want to share your love of the pod with the world and rock some fabulous merch at the same time, head over to the GPCD Threadless store. You'll find iconic designs, literally. One of the designs says, quote, iconic, end quote, on T-shirts, bags, stickers, magnets, mugs, and more. And each item purchased helps to support our podcast. Check out the store now by visiting gpcd.threadless.com. Hey, it's Leash. And me, Joey Bowie. And I'm Rar. And we are Pocket Pod. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Guess what? Pocket Pod is an Animal Crossing podcast and so much more. We talk about video games and pop culture. We also talk about bugs and birds. And we sing a lot. So come join us and subscribe to the Pocket Pod podcast today. Available wherever fine podcasts are found. The Neatcast, your source for offbeat news, hot takes on sports, and deep dives into the paranormal. Join us every Monday and let's talk some bullshit. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting apps. Welcome back for round three of our best TV series canceled too soon debate. Obviously, this was not produced by Joss Whedon or Brian Fuller, or we would have already been off the air by now. Before we get into the <laughs> Elite Eight matchups, I want to ask my panel, where can people find you on social media so that they can yell at you and not just me? Please don't yell at my panelists. Uh, Ama, you first. <laughs> I really don't want to get yelled at, but if you do feel compelled to comment, I'm at Amamarfo, uh, all one word on Twitter and Instagram. And Joelle, how about yourself? Uh, you are welcome to yell at me at Joelle TB on Twitter because I don't use it very much. But if that but if you want to follow me and my friends in a fun podcast about Animal Crossing and other fun stuff, uh, I'm at the Pocket Pod on Twitter. Great. And Kate? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Kate Reculia, or if you just want to look at cute cat pics, yeah. I'm at Gomez Rack on Instagram. And you can find me at Eric Resniak on Twitter and Instagram. That's E R I C R E Z as in zebra, S as in snake, N as in Nancy, Y A K. Or you can just message the at Great Pop Culture Debate account on Insta, um, and you can absolutely yell at me all you want. I can take it. It won't be worse than what my mother calls me on a daily basis. So <laughs> now let's. You think I'm joking? Um, <laughs> <laughs> now let's move on to round three before ABC Family decides to bring down the hammer. So first up is Freaks and Geeks versus Better Off Ted. I'm going to go around the horn for votes. I'm going to start with Ama. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Better Off Ted. Uh, Joelle. Freaks and Geeks. Kate. Freaks and Geeks. I'm going Freaks and Geeks too, Ama. I'm sorry. That's fine. All right. Next up, it's Sports Night versus Party Down. I'm going to start this time with Kate. Sports Night. Joelle. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh party down ama uh party down <laughs> i'm also party down <gasps> ah, 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 whoa. all right next up pushing daisies versus don't trust the bee in apartment 23 i'm gonna start with joelle <laughs> it's pushing daisies <laughs> ama don't trust the bee <laughs> kate <gasps> pushing daisies i'm also pushing daisies Holy and crap. my so-called life versus studio 60 on the sunset strip ama you go first Studio 60. Kate? <laughs> my so-called life. Joelle? My so-called life. My so-called life. I'm sorry, Alma. How many Alma, of your picks just went out Alma, right there? My that heart. Was... <laughs> this, listen, this happens to me every time I come here, and yet I keep coming back. So I knew what was going to happen. Oh, we told hurts. you from the start just how this would end. All right. So we have a final a four of Freaks and Geeks versus Party Down and Pushing Daisies versus My So-Called Life. Wow. Uh, and I always like to take a step back now and take a look at how this ended up. I would say um, three out of four of these are one seeds. So that makes sense. The mm -hmm. only one seed that's not here is Firefly. And I think that there are a lot of people who um, 
would probably think that it should be, but I think we had very good arguments for why it's not. And we were saying in the quick break that there's a lot of workplace comedies here and we just got rid of, oh, most of them. <laughs> so it's now one workplace comedy, uh, a teen drama, another teen drama, and I don't even know how the hell to categorize Pushing oh, Daisies. Oh, I got this. I got this. I wrote this down from, it's from Wikipedia, but <laughs> they had 700 names for it. It's a fairy tale dark comedy drama. That's exactly what it is. And it's about pie. Yep. So we're it's going to pie. jump into the final four <laughs> matchups, Freaks and Geeks versus Party Down. Um, Ama, where are you on this? <sighs> this is a tough one because they're both so impactful they're both really good for what they were and i think they both had great potential to do a lot more um when i think about what kind of has had a greater impact on tv landscape as a whole freaks and geeks has done a lot in a lot of ways for like what we think teen tv is how we cast teens on tv so i'm giving it to freaks and geeks kate an excellent argument yes i'm giving it to freaks and geeks for how influential it is for how it was uh, for how ahead of its time it was it, it just never found in its moment i also saw it when i was older i saw it when i was mm, in my mid-20s maybe um and right around the time actually that all of the star the teen stars of this were kind of starting to like break out i want to say it was maybe it was the summer i was in la so i read the screenplay that would become super bad and super bad hadn't <laughs> come out yet um so it's as it's sort of like a microcosm of like a talent pool that would explode um i think i have to give it to freaks and geeks and as as something that also there was more and the more that we saw was their work but not in freaks and geeks form mm -hmm. uh joelle uh so this is like martin star versus martin star right um we're just yes. deciding yes. oh gosh star it is like i really i really want bill haverchuk to fight roman um would oh, we call this star crossed oh, oh. where's my da if you're listening home please imagine david caruso with the shades and the scream <laughs> from the who anyway go ahead joelle well i would say that martin star and freaks and geeks would have biff behind him helping him yes, fight he martin would. star he would in party down um both of these shows came to me when i needed them most literally i watched freaks and geeks at my senior year in high school and i watched party down right after i graduated college like both of these shows just they they were they were they were me they were like the millennial show they followed me around um when it comes down to it freaks and geeks sits with me also by the way it's a lizzie kaplan off as well and she was also yeah awesome. it is. Oh, good heavens it is <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so yeah is. freaks and geeks for me i just that show is just dear dear to my heart yeah, to me, this one's not that hard. I think Freaks and Geeks has a uh, real kind of legacy to it that I don't think Party Down does. Mm -hmm. I think Party Down, like if you knew about Party Down, because it was on Stars, right? Yeah. yeah. Like nothing yeah. on, look at, look at Stars' as fields. They are fallow. Like it, it, there's no, like, like <laughs> to we this joke day, about, Outlander has maybe broken through a little yeah. bit. Still. Yeah, but like. Everything else that's planted there dies. And it's mostly because stars themselves ki kills it, right? Like they're just really bad at, at nurturing original programming. Um, but so it, it kind of is this niche little thing where if you knew it, then you understood and appreciated how wonderful it was. I guess you could say the same thing is true for Freaks and Geeks, except it was on a mainstream network. Mm -hmm. It was completely like – uh beloved by critics right like at the time it was a darling it, yeah it was yeah, it was totally a darling and it was just like jackhammered into you if you were a television viewer if you are not watching freaks and geeks then you are an idiot and you have no class and you are a slob like that's how i interpreted it um <laughs> and i mean look at america 2021 nobody watched freaks and geeks here we are so um <laughs> With that said, I think it needs to advance to the next round. Finally, we have Pushing Daisies versus My So-Called Life. And this one is hard, yo. So I'm going to start. Is it? I is think it, it is. Joelle, you go first. Without even a little bit of question, My So-Called Life. Kate? My So-Called Life. Ama? My So-Called Life. Oh my God. So you all were torn on the last one. I couldn't care less. This one I'm really torn on. And I, I will just say this. Um, I respect that Pushing Daisies is going out. 
I, I get that. And I'm not mad about it because I loved my so-called life. That was my sweet spot. And I'm not going to get into it because we're going to get to it in a second. But I will say this about um, Pushing Daisies. In the intro, um, I think it was Joel was saying, I feel like uh, Pushing Daisies wrapped up exactly the way it was supposed to. And it left me you know, satisfied. And in fact, <laughs> no. Pushing Daisies <laughs> was a, a good, another critical darling the first year it came out. And it was really blooming. I'm, I was not trying to go for a corny dad joke there. But like it, the cast was it, like the whole show was beloved. It got, I think, Emmys. It was really kind of picking up steam. Then the writer strike happened, and mm-hmm. it completely derailed that show. And once it killed that momentum, the and I think they moved time slots. Like the viewership just fell off a cliff, and they could not get it back. And so the last like I don't know four episodes is when they knew they were canceled, and they just like hustled out like two years worth of plots in like four episodes and it broke my heart to watch as like huge moment after huge moment was like you have five minutes to make this major emotional beat like resonate and we've got to move on to the next one because we have like 17 other cast members that need their moment and it was just brutal it was it was really difficult to watch because they had created this wonderful little story and if you don't know if you've never heard of pushing daisies it's the story about this woman who dies she's murdered on a cruise ship and the mystery of what exactly happened is not solved by the end of the thing but she comes back to life and the guy who was in love with her was he in love with her back then or was that were they new acquaintances i can't remember i think they knew each other yeah i thought they were childhood friends or childhood yeah yeah. played by lee pace who is so dreamy in this (laughs) show and i'm using the word dreamy very intentionally he is just like i mean honkasaurus but like i'm talking old hollywood movie star type of charisma going on vibes he's a pie maker so she has the power to bring dead people temporarily back to life and there's detectives he has the power oh he has has the the power power. thank you so he brings her back to life and he keeps her alive her aunts don't know that she's back alive they have to constantly keep hiding it from her he runs this pie shop there's a detectives that solve mysteries it's got um kristen chenoweth it's got uh chi mcbride it's this wonderful cast and it's just this ridiculous show that makes no sense but it's so wholesome and just lovely (laughs) and to see it just get shuffled off so unceremoniously was really difficult for me as a viewer um all that said i understand my so-called life is advancing i just wanted to have give pushing daisies a moment it it deserves its moment it's a really it's a it's It's in the way that firefly is sort of like a perfect expression of the best things about a, a Whedon show. Like, I feel like Brian Fuller was really getting closer. He could make Hannibal because he made Pushing Daisies. Yes. And it was visually stunning as well. Oh, like, yeah, I mean, it, it was, was, it a... was incredible. And um, the narrator, um, uh, J- Jim, Jim Dale. Dale. Jim Dale. Yes. Yep. At the time, it was like, you know, another Harry Potter novel. Less exciting Seriously. nowadays. But at the time. <laughs> and there have been talks about bringing it back on some network. I would love to see that happen. There's so much more story to tell. And it, it really should. A Swoozy Kurtz. Amazing. Swoozy Kurtz. I was about to say, one of my absolute Ellen Green. favorite things about the show was Ellen Green and Susie Kurtz. Susie yes. Kurtz. Yep, I did it. Susie Kurtz. <laughs> I, can't, I still didn't say it right. <laughs> uh, synchronized swimming is what I was going to yes. say. <laughs> Everybody in the show has a quirk and i think that's probably why you're having a difficult time saying Susie kurtz um but we have a final two it's the teen drama uh (laughs) face-off freaks and geeks versus my so-called life one seed versus one seed ama where are you on this one oh gosh i was really hoping i wouldn't be first but my name starts with an a it happens (laughs) um so the challenge here for me is that we have an instance where we have two shows up against each other where one for all practical purposes would not exist without the other. I don't think we get freaks and geeks if we don't get my so-called life. So you then have to decide, do you reward the thing that created the blueprint or the one that escalated it to a point where people legitimately talk about it as being the series that was canceled too soon. I am going to give it to freaks and geeks, but it is incredibly close. Joelle. Is this my opportunity to, to like, defend my so-called life and absolutely we haven't we've really barely <laughs> talked about it this happens really it. this happens all the time with the ultimate number one seeds they just zip right through to the end and they don't really get their moment in the sun so my so-called life angela chase this the actress playing angela chase we all know claire danes to this day she was 15 years old when she was cast maybe she was mm-hmm. even 14 when she was cast when they filmed that pilot she was the babiest of baby faces um watching that pilot again 
this is this is 1994 this is 27 years later it was still as riveting as i remember it being i could not turn away i the the difference now 27 years later is that like i start getting the parents a little bit more because i'm basically their age and the Mm -hmm. parents are so well drawn they're so perfect versions of these like are we old enough to like pretend our kids don't exist? Should we have more kids? Are we young enough to do that? Am I old? This, that. Following that is like, oh wait, this is also 30 something mixed into a teen drama. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Freaks and Geeks, the parents were mostly sidelined. They were funny, sort of like, let's make fun of our dad for being so uptight and this person and that person. Obviously there were some dramatic moments, especially we talked about Kim's family at, at certain times, but take anything you saw in Freaks and Geeks and it was heightened and just incredible in my so-called life we would not have the wonder that is wilson cruz and enrique vasquez mm-hmm. in our in mm-hmm. our just cultural history without my yep. so-called life um he was you know the, the first time i saw a character like that on television probably the first time i saw a character like that in general i was 11 when the show came out and i went to a jewish hebrew day school i did <laughs> not have this kind of exposure at that point so i learned <laughs> i learned about the world through my so-called life it was it, it was it was just the most amazing. And this is a show I watched with my brother. And we literally referred to the show as, are we going to watch like, um you know, this app this evening? Like, we literally <laughs> called it like, um you know, because we thought the dialogue was so fantastic and exactly how people talk. Mm-hmm. It was it was just it, it was it, it felt like a moment, but it hasn't stopped. It, it feels accurate 27 years later. Which I think speaks to how it tapped into the essence of being a teenager and that's something everyone can identify with no matter what your background is obviously your mileage may vary like angela chase had a pretty charmed life compared to Mm -hmm. say ricky um but it there are certain universal truths that i think that that show dealt with way better than any other teen show before it Mm -hmm. and potentially after right yeah kate where are you I'm with my so-called life. Um, I did not watch this as a teen girl. Uh, at the time, I was like, I need to have murders and aliens. Like, I'm not interested in feelings. So, so I didn't watch it until I was, I don't know, I was in my late 20s. And like, I was so smacked by it and i think so the first time i watched it i was like i was not quite her parents age but like the the parents blew me away how much they are a character on the show how difficult bess are or, or, bess armstrong is incredible yeah and patty chase is an unbelievable character yeah um and it's just so beautifully written tenderly realized and and a lot of the my sort of like back and forth arguments about like what does it mean to be canceled too soon does it mean that there was more to go or is there also like can you be canceled too soon at the exact moment when you capture something that's formally thematically perfect about what you're doing right and i think that's why we gravitate toward these teen shows right like they they capture this sort of like uh what's the word when something's like happening fast zeitgeist Zeitgeist? or no, or like ephemerality mm. of like being mm. a teen. Right? Yeah. Like it's 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 not that long. It feels, it feels like forever yeah. when you're a teen, but it is no time at all. And so like one season of this per- show, it's perfect. Um and so daring and so like a watershed moment. It's like it being canceled too soon is both the thing that makes it heartbreaking and the thing that makes it perfectly itself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, um, I, I totally see the argument. I guess for me though, I would have loved to at least get to see them through high school because mm-hmm. like there was so much more to explore. Like we haven't even talked about Jordan Catalano. Oh Come my God. On <laughs> those eyes. Oh my God. Like, has there ever been a more perfect casting for the like, the fuck boy that you want mm-hmm. i swear he peaked right there guys i he mean did. no he, he really did. did and we've endured him for a great deal longer but he peaked then despite the oscars and all the music and everything no you're absolutely right yep. <laughs> yeah and yep. he's been fight jared leto if you don't know who we're talking about he's been the fighting the hot champion ever since 1994 because he just keeps trying to look not as 
incredibly gorgeous as he mm-hmm. is in this show. And I, I feel dirty and potentially illegal even saying that because I'm pretty sure he was a minor, but um, so perfectly classed. Rian Graf oh, as that mm-hmm. messy Rian. girl who's your friend. But like, we all had that friend, right? The one who's 100%. just like, you can skip class. Don't be a yep. loser. Then you've got fucking Brian Krakow as the kid who's like so endearing and he's such a dweeb. And like you want to like you want to be a, in hindsight is he an incel i don't know maybe i don't know i don't know he might be now yeah he might, he might be, be now. now um i don't actually want to know what happened to brian no, Krakow because no. i don't think it ends anywhere other than pleated khaki pants um <laughs> but sharon chersky sharon oh, Chirsky. Sharon. oh <laughs> sharon like it, it, and danielle little danielle when she gets her episode oh. like it's it, also the way that it's sort of like has tackles the sort of quote unquote very special episode teen subjects but like makes them part of an ongoing storyline yeah. right yeah. instead of just like this episode we're going to talk about cults like <laughs> it's 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 just such a god it's such a good show it's a great show i don't think it i think it could have gone at least another two seasons until yeah. they, they it graduated. could have mm-hmm. but do you know why it didn't like Oh. Claire Danes was like, I am a teenager. This is too much. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. And, and like, that's part of why I'm like, girl, like, you made the right decision. Sure. <laughs> sure. And I, I, I'm sure the other member of the cast were like, what the fuck? But you can't do the show <laughs> without Claire Danes. No. Um, but. <laughs> yeah. I guess that is a a strong statement for why it should have ended where it did. I just. I was 16 when the show was on. So for me and like Kate and I went to high school together. So certainly drink. I, I drank um, our childhoods were not like the childhoods of Angela Chase and everybody else. They were from a much more um, how's the word that we can use this like legitimate high school. Is that fair? Like <laughs> it wasn't in a cow town. Like, is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. They were aspirational to me. And yet at the same time, very real. Those were mm-hmm. people I knew as opposed to Dawson's Creek, which I think was certainly inspired by this show. And nobody on Dawson's Creek, like no one I knew spoke the way those kids on Dawson's Creek spoke, but the mm-hmm. people on, on my so-called life. We, we kind of did Eric. Did you we? And, I and Bob did. Yeah. <laughs> you know what the best comparison for the show was at the time it's like it, it's it's counterparts were were not to a note or saved by the bell so yeah like, yep. right? those were like, the options th- th- those were the most unrealistic versions of high school anyone's ever seen and then this show comes out and like you know in between yeah so with that being said i believe we are currently three to my so-called life one to freaks and geeks uh does that sound correct ama you're sticking with freaks no i've been swayed i'm gonna go <laughs> over to my so-called life because i do think uh. that Again, Freaks and Geeks benefits from the blueprint of my so-called life, and you don't get one without the other. So I'm willing to honor the original here. I think that makes the most sense. All right. So, and the, the other two of you are sticking with my so-called life, Joelle? Without question. And Kate? I feel so good about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there you have it. Our pick for the best TV series canceled too soon is my so-called life. Do you agree? Do you think that teenage hormones have driven us mad? Tell us how you really feel by leaving a comment on this episode at greatpopculturedebate.com or find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. While you're there, make sure that you subscribe and follow the podcast so you can hear about what new debates are coming soon, vote in open polls, and even decide on which topics we tackle next. I want to say thank you to my panel. You are all picked up for another season and thank you for listening if you loved what you heard please consider supporting us on patreon where you can get even more exclusive content and you get episodes a whole day early we hope that you have a good one and remember everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion 